with Dr. Brad Tucker and Matt Miller. This is Talking Science on Trek Zone. Well, welcome to the show. It is Tuesday. It's Talking Science. We're a little bit later today because uh, I'm really falling into holiday mode. Dr. Brad Tucker, astrophysicist at a the Australian National University, is with me as he always is. Brad, happy the moon is all over. Yeah, I mean, it's look, I, hey, it's been super exciting, but it's been. I have a tad more time now than I did last week. <laughs> let's just say that it was look, it was good. It was full on, but running 38 events over five days oh. plus everything else. It, it's been full on. Wow. Uh, it's kept you busy then. It did. But look, I mean, what I and I think everyone wanted to, we had lots of great events with everyone. Uh, you know, we got to celebrate uh, Australia and the people who did that. And also, you know, one of the things I kept hearing from actually from the people from NASA and others is they just didn't appreciate how big of a role Australia played until they came here. Um, and they were quite excited by that. Um, so, look, you know, I think that that's all good. Um, and uh, but yes, I'm. I have a reprieve now until the U.S. and Science Week over the next couple of weeks. But you know, I got today. <laughs> Get exclusive access to podcasts and behind-the-scenes info by becoming a member on Patreon today. Supporting Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek gets even better with membership starting at just one dollar per month. Jump over to Patreon.com/slash TrekZoneOrg AU. And of course, you can find Brad on Twitter at btucker22 and on Facebook Dr. Brad Tucker, and you can find me at miromat86 on Twitter and Instagram. Brad, a couple of headlines today uh, to get us into our Vegas or bust tour. Sorry, by the way, that your invite got lost in the mail. <laughs> so surprise, I'm in the US next week. <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts are you? I'm going to New York, Boston, and DC. Oh. We'll both be in the US, just on different coasts. Uh, this is also something that's happened in the past three days. But, you know, that's the way life goes. That's pretty exciting. But Talking Science is going to continue? That's right. We will be doing it. I think we'll have a live episode or an episode from the U.S. when we're both there. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll have to rethink my intro then because it was going to be something about you not being in Hawaii. Well, but... I won't be in Hawaii. Well, you're still, not in... you're still not, I suppose. That's right. Now, the headlines. Uh, India's mission is on the way to the moon. Yeah. Look, you know, we talked about last week how it had a, a bit of a, a snag uh, in the leaking of the essentially the third stage. But, uh, you know, as we hope hoped that it was a fairly quick fix and they were being more precautionary than, than anything. Turned out to be true. Um, they had a very successful launch last night and it's uh, making its way, I think, the 45-day trip to the moon. It is incredible and it comes one day after 50 years since Apollo 11. So 50 years plus one. That's right. So look, you know, it's nice, you know, um, and it kind of just shows how far things have come. You know, uh, the Apollo missions were, were billions, I think, in today's dollars it's 180 billion this cost i think it was uh 400 or maybe 300 million yeah uh, a lot lot cheaper obviously that doesn't include the rocket and things like that but it, the prices have come down the accessibility has come down uh and it will be a very uh, i think ambitious mission and so i hope that uh, it's all successful for india all the way through one thing i didn't realize is that uh, it was supposed to be a joint venture for joint venture with russia that's right there was originally a plan of uh coordinating a, a new goal india though i think well the russians have been a bit slow i think um in trying to gather what they wanted to do um i think there's a bit of story to how it unfolded um also the other thing that did happen is India said, look, we, we kind of really want this to be an Indian-led thing. Um, India's really been promoting India's race as a superpower. So the last thing that you want as a space superpower is to be helped out by the Russians or, or the Americans, to be fair. Um, so they kind of win it all themselves, um, which, which is a very ambitious goal because this mission has a, both a lander and a rover. So the lander will come, the rover will attach from it, uh, and then do some experiments. And it's all headed to the South Pole, um, where NASA has also said it wants to go to because as this is where it appears to be this very ice-rich water environment. And huge deposits of helium-3. That's right. This is uh, where everyone wants the land to, to extract resources, to mine it. And in fact, it was actually one of India's first moon mission that did an orbiter and did the impactor where it essentially shot something into the moon that proved the moon was rich in ice. So in fact, 
you kind of have to thank India for this big race to the moon because they showed their stuff there to be used and doing it. So, you know, don't ignore India in terms of this new race to the moon and also the race in space. They they said they want to also send up an, an Indian astronaut on an Indian rocket into space by, I think, 2022. Ambitious, but they're doing it. So, you know, um, good luck to them. New content is being added all the time to Trek Zone's YouTube channel. Talking Science with Dr. Brad Tucker on Tuesdays, Trek Zone Live on Thursdays, and a Trek Zone Conversation on Saturdays. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe and ring the bell to get fresh public releases. One place we might go to and we've talked about ast uh, astronomers naming things in the past, Blunets. What's going on here, Brad? Well, we've run out of creative ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so look, all right, a planet is a, a planet that actually was a moon, but the moon escaped. <laughs> but but this is so it's interesting. <laughs> Besides, terribly, terribly named um, for all the right and wrong reasons. <laughs> one of the things is that how all right. Let's say you have a moon around a planet. What happens if that moon escapes and then just escapes to start orbiting the star? By definition, it would be round, it would have cleared its path, and it would be orbiting a star. It, for all intents and purposes, is an exoplanet by that point. But it didn't form as an exoplanet, it formed as a moon. And so there would probably be distinct differences in its formation. So what do you call it? A planet. <laughs> Because exoplanet was so wrong. Well, yeah, it's. But I think one of the cool things it's trying to show that there probably are distinct classes of objects that maybe don't fit the normal way planets and moons fit. And one of the reasons is that we think there are a few weird exoplanets that don't quite fit the mold. That there, there's something about them that seems strange, and you know, they don't seem to have the properties and behaviors of a normal exoplanet um, in terms of its distance and the size relative to the distance from its star. But we also know planets are common. We also know moons are common. So look, it's, I, I think the thing is, the cool thing is we're in this world now that everything and everything is possible. So why not? <laughs> and have we discovered any planets, or, or are we just speculating here? So, so there is a, there is an idea that there is one planet out there, and this is kind of what started this whole idea. Is that it's? I mean, look, formally it'd be called a tidally a detached exomoon, but that is Ugh, really boring. Yeah, exactly. Planet. I know. Come on, <laughs> that's why. So it's believed that um, maybe Kep Kepler fifteen twenty, one of the planets there, could have been it. You know, and that could have explained it. Uh, but but again, it's it's twofold. It's one that there's it's a hypothetical, and second, um, in doing the hypothetical and running a bunch of simulations, they showed that well it could happen because the biggest category of planet we have right now is hot Jupiter's big planets really close to their star orbiting only three or four days. You can imagine with that because the gravity of the star is so much stronger than the gravity of that planet it could pull away one of the moons of that planet and eventually kind of suck it in into orbit around it actually not unlike we think what happened to the largest moon of neptune triton we believe the largest moon of neptune triton was actually a dwarf planet got too close to neptune neptune's gravity hold on to it and pulled it into a moon wanted to protect it keep it safe that's right wanted to protect it so you know not an outlandish idea w will remain to be seen if we have more planets on the radar but you know it's uh i think it's always nice to see that everything and everything is out there you can get social with Trek Zone. Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek is everywhere you are. Get the wrap up on our Facebook page. Keep in the loop on Twitter and relive Trek episodes on Instagram. Just search for Trek Zone. Where where do we go from here? What's what's next? We've had we've had you know uh, Apollo 11's 50th. Uh, we've, we're discovering planets. India's off to the moon. What's what's next for us? What else could we be doing? What else is out there? Look, I, I think there's a lot. I think, um, you, you know, what we're starting to see is this r new race. There's this new rush. There's more groups that are coming into it. You know, don't ignore what India is playing. Don't ignore, you know, China's playing to the moon. Um, and I think it's all about what we heard uh, as part of the 50th anniversary is, is where Australia is fitting into this thing. I think we're going to start seeing Australia having a bigger role. There's been a lot of talks over the past week from actually not only just the big events, but the people talking behind the scenes about what can happen. And so I think what we will start to see is 
more rapid progress. And, and we've already seen this in the past 10 years. But what I'm saying is, you know, it's been a long time since the 50th anniversary of the moon landing and, and that quintessential big moment. I think we're going to start to see more and more of these big moments happen faster and faster. Return to the moon, looking to Mars, um, humans, you know, in orbit around another object. That's a big thing. Humans in a semi permanent orbit around another object that's not mm. the Earth, i.e., a space station around the moon. That's kind of cool that they will stop for literally the, def the meaning of the definition being Earthlings at that point. They'll be moonlings. <laughs> you know, it's so I think it's all these little things on the radar, but they're going to start happening quicker and quicker and quicker. And then there's also the private tourism aspect, which is, is here and now. So it's an exciting time. And, of course, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot said about the countries that, that are contributing to this new space race, India and China and Russia and America to a degree with, with their current geopolitical climate and all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, we really are here at Talking Science and I think in the scientific community uh, as a whole, it really is about that scientific exploration and trying to ignore all the other stuff that, that goes on, all the politics and all that sort of stuff and just be scientific and further humankind's understanding of the cosmos yeah exactly that's I, I think one of the big things is that there is this spirit that you know 50 years ago it was very much because there was this race between two countries now that isn't as much it, there is a race and there is as we talked about a race between the countries and private companies but it's a lot more friendlier of a race. It's very less political. Like, it, you know, it's good to have a bit of competition, but what you're, we're already seeing is a lot of work behind the scenes, talking to each other, collaborating, and that's going to happen faster and faster um, because of this desire for exploration and advancing it. And in fact, linking back to 50 years ago and showing what can happen when you do these big endeavors and human, uh, unite humankind, you can achieve big things. And it's kind of applying that spirit of Apollo 11 to this new space race. Fantastic, Brad. Well, thanks as always for talking science with me. And uh, we'll catch you next week when we're a little bit further apart. I thought A little bit closer than I thought we were going to be, but still a little bit further apart. So still further. I mean, a flight from Hawaii to, to Boston, which I've done, is eight hours. Well, it's, it's not too bad. It is five no. hours to Perth, after all. That, that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it's almost like Hawaii is the midway point between Australia and uh, Boston in retrospect. So. Well, it's part of the reason that we're, that we're kicking off the tour, the Vegas or Bust tour uh, in Hawaii, because it is centrally, almost centrally located uh, as a perfect stopping off point. And, hey, the beaches of Waikiki, you can't go wrong. That's right, exactly. <laughs> uh, enjoy it. Thanks very much, Brad. We'll uh, talk to you next week. Thanks. 